job uh, that is done in the terrific architecture series. Thank you very much. We look forward to it. Um, today, uh, it, it, it is uh, fitting that we kick off the series with uh, Filippo Caprioglio, who um, is uh, not only our uh, visiting professor of practice uh, and, and, and the first uh, of a hopefully uh, fortunate series that we are going to have. It's a program that uh, we'd like to start here at the school uh, to uh, uh, more uh, engage uh, the world of, uh, uh, of uh, architecture in the profession uh, and, and academia. And, um, and uh, with the, with the, after this lecture, we'll uh, also uh, open uh, the exhibition of uh, his work. And um, you are all uh, invited, of course, uh, to uh, hang, hang in, uh, in the hallway and, and, and see the, the work that is displayed after this presentation. To that uh, um, effect, uh, I'd like to thank uh, those who helped uh, putting the exhibition together. Uh, uh, first, uh, starting <coughs> Starting with uh, Shahad, is Shahad here? Thank you, Shahad. <laughs> Ryan, is Ryan here? No, he's not. But Ryan, uh, our uh, shop supervisor, did a great job in uh, uh, refurbishing uh, the, the exhibition space. And uh, Bob Webb, that uh, uh, masterminded the exhibition along with uh, with Philippe Bob. Thank you. This program of, uh, the, uh, of the visiting professorship uh, is, uh, as you uh, can imagine, uh, uh, a, a, a substantial effort for, uh, for us, for the university. Uh, it's something that uh, other programs have. Venice to Venice, 
from Venice, Italy. <laughs> so Venice, California, as the last speaker. I don't know if I'll be one. But anyway, uh, I'd like to uh, frame his, uh, his work within the line of inquiry research that somehow characterized uh, uh, Italian architecture and design but through a few key uh, critical figures that uh, may be not well known to you. Um, one is, uh, and, and probably the, the most uh, uh, important, the most representative of this uh, figure of, uh, uh, this professional figure of uh, a, a, an architect uh, uh, who uh, has engaged in himself and in everything of design is Franco Albini. Uh, Franco Albini was uh, Renzo Piano's uh, mentor for, uh, for, for the record. Uh, Piano uh, likes to recall that uh, he was, uh, when he was uh, intern, uh, working as an intern in, in Albini's office, he was uh, stating a uh, detail every day. Um, Meaning uh, how much uh, uh, Renzo Piano uh, owned, uh, I'm sure uh, you, you all know, uh, learned from uh, from Albini. And you can see just from a snapshot of the of the work that is uh, shown here, from uh, bookshelf to uh, exhibition installations to interiors, the measure in, uh, in Milan, uh, department store in Rome, and a, a, a very comprehensive master plan for Milan. Uh, in Milan, done back in, uh, in the 40s, um, the range of, uh, of explorations that uh, he engaged in. The, uh, that expression that uh, I had before at uh, the start of his introduction, from the spoon to the city, is actually a, a concept, a, a model, that uh, this uh, uh, architect and, and educator and Publicist that Ernesto Nato Rogers came up with. And uh, he, he meant to convey this, uh, as he put it, this uh, Bauhaus basic concept uh, by which the method to deal with both the spoons is precisely the same, which is, just, is the scale of intervention. And you can see again also in the range of uh, projects uh, in which he engaged in, uh, from industrial design again to the uh, marvelous uh, refurbishing and installation of the museum in the uh, castle in Milan, uh, even the installation of uh, Michelangelo's uh, wonderful statue of the last of Vietnam to high rise in Milan. He uh, engaged in this also through the uh, magazine uh, Casabella uh, that he directed for a couple of decades, the uh, 50s and 60s where he actually added that uh, uh, term, continuità, to the title of the, of the magazine to mean <coughs> that uh, the modern movement, the modernism, was meant to uh, remain in continuity with the larger traditional culture of, uh, of, the, of, the, of places in this kind, in this place, Italy, but this could be applied to many. And so, uh, his his uh, uh, contribution was also to, uh, to frame this, uh, this notion of tradition as a positive, progressive term. He used to refer to tradition, to the origin of the name tradition as the Latin trahere, to pull. And, and this is uh, important, I think, because you see some of these uh, Italian designers and, and Filippo Silia as a very contemporary example of this tradition, uh, moving forward within a line of research, a line of inquiry. Uh, another famous uh, follower of uh, Rogers was Aldo Rossi, of course, who worked at Casabella and the magazine, and not only engaged, uh, again, in every field of design, but also uh, in theory, by publishing the landmark uh, book, uh, The Architecture of the City, Vittorio Gregotti also was in that team at Casabella and the magazine. And again, uh, he's probably the most uh, representative in terms of scales of engagement, from the door handle to large master plans. Also published a, a landmark book uh, called, uh, titled El Territorio del Futuro, El Territorio del Futuro. Gaia Laurenti, 
famous uh, refurbishing of the Gare d'Orsay in Paris, Chiboueri, uh, elegant designs and, and, and uh, superbly uh, detailed uh, designs at every scale, from, from furniture to, to houses. Marco Zanuso, author of uh, uh, industrial designs that became somehow icons of modern living, of modern lifestyle, uh, at the same time uh, uh, engaging uh, with the uh, architectural scale. And the results also took uh, many a more uh, irreverent and uh, controversial path, uh, also on, on, on uh, the edge of uh, postmodernism, but certainly very experimental, very uh, engaging. And more uh, recent uh, generations, like uh, uh, Antonio Citerio, and uh, Michele De Lucchi, uh, again, uh, showing uh, from, from uh, a land to infrastructure, to a bridge, the, the range of scales in which uh, uh, this uh, designers, these architects uh, engaged. And in fact, uh, uh, De Lucchi is, uh, uh, also, uh, has been also a partner of Filippo in uh, one of his recent projects. So from this from the spoon to the city. And uh, I think that uh, Filippo will show us um, how fitting his work is uh, uh, within uh, this, uh, this line of research. Filippo Caprioli received his degree at the uh, School of Architecture in Venice. Uh, one of the many things that uh, we have in common. <laughs> um, and then uh, he went on to receive a Master of Architecture at Syracuse University where he also taught uh, both the uh, main campus and uh, the study abroad uh, uh, campus in Florence, in Italy. He then uh, uh, joined uh, his father, Giovanni, in the firm of uh, Capriolio Associati, uh, which is a highly successful firm in Italy, uh, dealing uh, with uh, projects in, in uh, uh, residential uh, sector, adaptive reuse, uh, little store design, um, offices and inter international competitions at various scales. He personally uh, has engaged more uh, specifically in industrial design, and uh, uh, you would find also his designs are available here in this country to uh, all modern uh, site. Um, in December 2011, he won the Chicago Tenium International Industrial Design uh, Award. Uh, since 2002, he has uh, taught with many universities, uh, including the Kent State University in Florence, uh, which was uh, our first uh, occasion to meet and collaborate together. And um, in 2008, he was a uh, uh, key uh, distinguished professor at the University of Maryland. He has lectured internationally and uh, published in articles, magazines, and books uh, in Italy and abroad. Uh, more recently, uh, his firm uh, has uh, won two major competitions, which uh, uh, can only be talked about. Unfortunately, it's uh, too recent to show work. <laughs> uh, there are still a confidentiality uh, uh, rule clause on that. But uh, there are competitions related uh, to the Expo 2015 in Milan, uh, both in, uh, in Milan, on the Milan site, uh, together with uh, uh, Michele De Lucchi, one of the designers that uh, we mentioned before, and uh, on a site uh, near Venice, uh, the edge of the Venetian Lagoon, where the Expo 2015, uh, based in Milan, we have a satellite branch location on the larger theme of uh, food and water, etc., which is actually a sign also on which uh, uh, our uh, students in the fifth year studio uh, are currently working on. Uh, that's an exciting uh, opportunity. If further ado, please welcome Filippo Cardio.
by being here, which uh, I really uh, feel honored to be your first visiting professor of practice. I thank Bob for the help on the exhibition and Dave for running with me the fifth year students and all the other colleagues that I know go by each name, but I uh, really you guys make uh, my coming here very warmly welcome and I really appreciate that a lot. And I thank you also a lot to the people that outside the school help uh, Mavizia in getting me here. So thank you. Thank you a lot. I, I appreciate it. As Gerard said, um, our way of thinking, um, it's uh, the way of a non-specialized firm. And when Mavizia told me that uh, he was thinking to have a lecture series based on Design 360, I thought immediately that was fitting perfectly with the, our way of thinking. Um, and so, thinking 360 degrees was uh, the natural title for that. As I said, I will expose you to different scales, different projects, different possibilities that, fortunately, through great clients, because without them we won't do much. Uh, we were able to be engaged, explore, research, and maintain a degree of curiosity which I'm talking to you, young guys, I think is the most important thing an artist should have. So curiosity and traveling, I think, are two key elements that for us will change the way we, we do things and we think uh, in general. As Maurizio also said, um, I'm a lot engaged with uh, industrial design as part of my research, personal research inside the office. He put me a lot of pressure by showing you those big names. All those guys have uh, pieces at the moment. I don't. But, uh, I mean, let's, let's work in this direction. So, those uh, words that come there are actually uh, elements that took part in any of our projects and really says what we love to work with randomly. Those two quotes were actually placed by two great friends and mentors of mine. And I think uh, in, three, in three lines and in five lines, the second one, better described than me, what we do because they were able to condense. So I thought to put them up there so you know what you're facing and what you will see. And before I start showing you projects and research, I'd like to say that all the things you will see won't be possible without my team and my father and my partner. Now you see this position uh, was a little bit done for joke but you see that we try to mimic the CSI, so to do re research of detail every single minute, okay? So this is very important for us. So I subdivide in chapter uh, the, this lecture, and uh, those are the key four words for this coming project. And the first one, deal, I thought it was uh, an homage to, to my city to start with one of the most uh, uh, important building that we have in Venice, which is the house of the University of Venice, which is Cafoscari. Cafoscari was a project that, that we won through a competition. It stays on the Canal Grande, from the Rialto Bridge that is there, there. You can see it, and you can see it also from the other coming view. This is a, a, an old print from the 1741, and this is Cafoscari during a parade that uh, occurred on the lagoon. Those images uh, were very helpful for us to prepare our research so you guys don't have to, uh, to say, oh, okay, the professor will all ask me to search for precedent and research. We do it also when we are professionals. And so all those images really help us out. I'm, I'm sorry for the definition of some images. We had some little issue with them. Um, with the monitor, but I think it's clear anyway. And so to find out which were 
the most recent trace of the Kafuskari at this original uh, stage uh, uh, within all the many, many, we counted more than 20, 22 intervention of little restoration, fixing up. But recently, in the past 20 years, uh, the university didn't have much funds, and so the really situation they were facing was pretty bad. Fortunately, then they find how to finance the intervention, and through a competition, uh, they set it up uh, the restoration, but not just the restoration, also a new, I would say, uh, repolish and bringing back to its uh, origin the building that it's uh, spectacular for the one of you who have been to Venice. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. What is important of, Venetian, of a Venetian palazzo of this kind is of course the uh, possibility that you face the building two sides from the water, which is the most important and prominent part, where the nobles, in this case the Foscari family that gave the name, they were doge of the city, and also from the courtyard on the back. This courtyard had been closed for many, many years, and actually the university wanted it this way, but one of the things that we introduced in the, in the competition proposal was to open up back the courtyard to the city, and having the possibility, now you see here some of the drawing, to clarify very well the so-called portico, the internal portico, inside the, the palazzo, and so to have a direct connection between the water and the courtyard, but also to open a cafeteria and a gallery here on the adjacent building, which is Palazzo Giustinian. So the two buildings work together. You will see from this elevation and coming section that they are not at the same level. You see the fenestration here, the fenestration there. So to connect those two buildings really is where we had to put our hands on. And there was this element in between that fortunately helped us to manage the differences between the two section heights. And as I said, the fact that we introduced this cafeteria, this gallery, and among other elements, was really uh, one of the key points that the jury appreciate in uh, awarding us the project. Here you see what I'm talking about. We pass from different mezzanine level, you know, Venetian palazzo as uh, uh, the noble floor, the main floor, and uh, the others that can be very squeezed and the structure very different. And, of course, it's a university building, and we need to have uh, uh, two the so called Aula Magna in lecture hall. And one of them that uh, we'll get soon in the 50 was uh, uh, rethought by Carlos Carpa. Carlos Carpa, I hope you all guys know who I'm talking about, but uh, just a couple of words. Uh, uh, I would say a genius, someone you cannot copy, but someone you have to study basically every day. Uh, for his uh, mania, if you want attention to materials and details. It was a great, um, a great moment for us to be able to review his original drawing and sketches, the real ones that were preserved, that helped us to find out some of his design, talking about industrial design, like for instance, this land that were in the main hall. And also, one of the other topic was to Preserve because of our local heritage that, of course, basically you cannot touch anything. Everything must be reversible. So the other proposal that make us uh, winning the competition was that instead of uh, creating like steel structure, even if hidden to support and re-help the original structure to to be um, able to work because there were really major problems of collapsing, we introduced those carbon fiber bands that went from one wall to the other and were attached to the slabs. So really like band-aid, but of carbon fiber that support the typical Venetian slabs that is very wobbly, but needs to be like that because it continues to, to 
to adjust. And so we, as I was saying, we polish up all the, the rooms. We went and were able to trace back the original paving and materials and element and uh, introduce when we had to connect the two elements a very light uh, and glass parapet stair, but to be very minimal and not to touch anything. As I said, Carlos Scarpa did the transformation of the main lecturer. Here you see one of his original sketch. Uh, the problem was that uh, those elements in wood were so carved and laid, decorated, that none of the general constructor that uh, came on site was able to do the same way. But so we did a further research and we find the name of the artisan at the time that worked with Scarpa, but unfortunately passed away. But his son uh, took, uh, as often happened in Italy, the, the job of his father and continued his tradition and he was so happy that we find them and through this research that he offered for free the work. So it was so honored to go back on the trace of that and is that this was the condition uh, during, during the site and when we were start to polish the element within substitute some, some of them, this was uh, in fact the condition we find during, during the first uh, visit to, to the site. And here is how, I mean, at the end, the main lecturer with those two uh, very important paintings, 1930 paintings, were, were done, but also all the fenestration were put back with great respect to the initial Scarpa design that, as you can see, matched perfectly the colonnade of the quadrifora, so-called uh, typical windows. Some other uh, shots of the interior that were put back uh, in its splendor. All the ceilings are one different from the others. They were, they were covered with gypsum uh, ceilings. So, I mean, the restoration one went on for two years, but now, I mean, the, the Kafoska is back to to its uh, origin. This is one of the interior courtyard when we reset the old well that was taken off. And this is uh, still during the work, but the day the facade uh, was uh, revealed, repolished uh, with all its, uh, its beauty and splendor. And I would say with all its lightness uh, that uh, all those uh, Venetian palaces, even if they seem so in a way massive, carry this sense of gentle lightness that I think uh, this next image shows you to see how, in fact, they become lanterns in the night. And uh, it was, since I was a kid, one of my favorite things, looking inside <coughs> this building at night because you see everything, basically. So everything is exposed. And so in this project, with a sense of context uh, and uh, the sense of uh, uh, acting with the great respect with the same respect, but with a very, and total, I would say, different topic, we approached this project for this uh, toll gate that is still today uh, the bigger toll gate in Europe as a toll gate that uh, has, uh, you know, the typical toll gate has the doors for the cars. I don't know if there's a specific term in English, but you understand where the cars, the cars pass through. And it, those are usually linked to a sort of a roofing system altogether. <coughs> We came here after the client said to us, listen, we are in a flat land, uh, we want this uh, new toll gate to be recognizable and visible from a very large distance, and so we want to make an iconic piece. So, you know, an iconic piece uh, on the right, the highway, wasn't that uh, an easy topic, but we came out again by researching the context, and you have to know that in Italy, you used to recognize the city by their bell tower, by the campanile, so-called, that actually started the word in Italian, which is campanilismo. That means that everyone is so affectionate to their bell tower that they're so proud of their city. And so the campanile was the only way in those flatlands to recognize the places. 
And the Campanile was uh, the source of inspiration for us in this, uh, as I said, very flat land here. And here is where the uh, toll gate will be located. We start then with a very free plan. We want to use material of the tradition at the same time give uh, this iconic sense uh, of something very light. The commission was for um, 14 doors for cars, 11 or 15, I don't recall exactly. And so we decided to break the symmetry of the, of the entrance and exit because we needed to have much more flow in entering this uh, area of the city, but then, sorry, of the land, because then you can go to the seaside and is where usually all the queues used to, to form. So we just need many more access towards the sea versus the people that come, come back home from that. And so, as I said, we uh, work with a, a sort of a Leonard desk machine with the will of uh, having a central core, very solid, that you will see in the coming images will be clad in bricks, which is a very typical stone for this area of Italy. We are in Friuli Venezia Giulia, up north of Venice, uh, 150 kilometers north. And the rest, two suspended wings that you can see in this section here. Two wings that are supported by those cables that are, support, that are attached to this high point of the ideal campanile, of the ideal bell tower that makes this toll gate recognizable. Now, what I was saying before, the gates are not attached to any of the roofing, so those two wings really uh, move a little bit with the wind, even if they are, of course, tied to the ground, and we wanted them to, to move a little bit to, to give this sense of lightness. Now, in this lecture, you will see, because I think it's important for you guys, uh, many of the ongoing process before the final result and situation that demonstrate you which was the condition where we started from, especially in adaptive reuse uh, situation. But here is some images of one of the two wings and how it has been constructed. So the first structure, then how it attached, then the secondary structure, the wood structure, and the central piece that has the uh, central core in concrete and then has this uh, wedge and metal. You see the secondary structure is like making a, a boat in reality. And then the final planning that starts to take over the entire wing system. Now, here we go with the with the toll gate uh, completely operable and done. As you can, to give you a sense of the proportion, uh, I like to make uh, those kind of examples so you guys can really picture in your mind. The two wings together uh, are one and a half football field. So you have an idea of what we are talking about and also you have an idea why it's very difficult to take a picture of this guy here. <laughs> <laughs> that really never ends, basically. Here, I'll give you some shot to show you also how everything is uh, crafted, detailed, and uh, everything controlled. Each one of those elements gets the water so that you uh, get uh, uh, those enormous surfaces that remain always uh, basically not dry, but never had the dropping of of the water, because otherwise it would be a disaster, like a water fountain cascade. Um, here, like we 90% of the time like to do, we expose the structure as much as we can. We work with it. If it's something to, to be shown, quite often the structure is hidden. We like to show it. And here, I think it's interesting for you to see how the combination of the three materials, so the more traditional one, as I said, the structure that is in blue because the client uh, has his logo all in blue and wanted the blue sign, plus all the metal cladding system of the, of the two wings that here you see on uh, the dusk and the night that are really, really effective, like you can see from this shot here. And so from uh, something like that, with those dimensions, I take you back in a more 
uh, urban but industrial context. This is an office building renovation and what we call the house of the guild of uh, the builders that we were honored that came to our office to, to commission as the, their home. So it's very nice when the general constructor can to the architect, no vice versa, you know, <laughs> doesn't have an offer. They pick uh, in a very smart way an area which is uh, Mestre City is here, Venice is down here, you can recognize the bridge and my class can recognize the area of the expo and the park here, but let's concentrate here. This is the industrial part of Marghera, also called Porto Marghera, Marghera Port. And they bought uh, this uh, unused, very solid uh, concrete uh, building of three floors that had a, a very determined structure, solid as I said, big, robust, and they said, that's what we have. You, we, they gave us the program and they asked us to take a, come out with something uh, specific for them. So we decided to, again, polish all the, the elements that were needed and to maintain the original structure that actually is very interesting because it's very narrow to support such an heavy load of slabs and, and panels. Uh, but when you are inside, it really gives you a sense of a, a the Kiriko with this progression and perspective of columns. So it was a nice effect that we decided to maintain. Part of the program was to have a conference center, and so we used the smaller adjacent building here to make it the, the main hall of entrance. And when you enter here, it's like uh, for Pinocchio entering in the whale, because uh, on top of that, I'll jump a moment to the study model. On top of that, there is, we plug in the conference center, and the cladding of the conference center goes all the way and enters also in the main hall. So you read the, the cladding and the material also inside. So it's like really entering in the mouth of the, of the way. This is a, one of the study models that we have done in the office. Um, now, what is important for us? Important is that, like I showed you before, that we use the, uh, the bricks as a local material. Now, we are trying as much as we can to make those uh, buildings sustainable, and making a sustainable building meaning, uh, means also that to acquire the material, uh, you tend not to make too many kilometers, not to have the thing shipped, uh, so you don't use carbon, gas, fuel, and so we were fortunate enough, as uh, you see, this is an industrial zone, um, less than 100 meters from this location, there is the producer, that is named Zintec, that made those zinc panels. And so we uh, told to the guys, listen, it might be very convenient uh, for you to go and negotiate and say to them, well, we're making a billboard building with your material, less than 100 meters from your from your place where you produce it, you don't want them to go to Rheinzink, right? In Germany. And so <laughs> they make the deal. And uh, the building is all planted in Rheinzink, in, not in Rheinzink, in Zintec, sorry, in Zintec, which is very similar. Uh, then you know, you can have more shine and less shine. And that, uh, if you're rich like Frank here, you go with titanium, but it's a different story. Um, this is the building, the one that you saw before in concrete. The start with this cladding thing. Now I said sustainable building. You see that on this south facade here, uh, where there are all the offices and the area where people get trained in the lower level, which is a double level, high level, so they read the dimensions and uh, learn how to make a, a wall digitally. And um, it's south. Need a lot of light for the reason I told you but of course it's exposed south. And so we add to this a, a second scheme. You see this structure, and you see that the form is uh, of a, a triangle. This is because uh, the perfect exposition of this wasn't completely south. And we need, you see here, when we start building the structure, we need to have a complete photovoltaic facade that we started with Shuko, now is a, uh, now 
it's uh, on the market, but at the time it wasn't, so they took the building for experiment. Where we had the louvers, that are all glass louvers with the photovoltaic uh, uh, seal, uh, see each other, see each other. See each other. Okay, in any case, the element that gets the sun and in buried inside the glass so that this, having the total south facade doing that, let uh, the building uh, sus uh, sustain itself for the energy at 80, 83% of its expenditures. So it's a very, very good result. On the north facade, where there are other offices, uh, you know, we maximize as much as we could the capture of the light for those guys. So you see among the very regular patterns of uh, square windows, you see that the window inside is tilted. So to be oriented like for the facade on south, also on the north side, and maximize, and maximize the, the window effect. See, okay. So then here we have the... Um, we have one of the entrance inside uh, the famous uh, mouth of the way. Here, a shot of the tower and the planning of the tower as a, uh, the vertical element that become also iconic. And a view from the other side of the industrial channel of the mounted facade to see here uh, with the louvers and this element that when we got the building was stopping here, so we extended to give this sense of verticality and to give in a way what I keep stressing in specifically in my class <coughs> telling them a building need to have a very strong and good attachment to the ground but even more attachment to the sky don't chop those buildings okay like pancakes just make them uh, finishing okay and so from this one I take you to a project that very dear to me that uh, if you want exposed uh, uh, more than every every time the, the office to the international critics because uh, uh, one day the architecture critic of the New York Times called the office say I want to make an article about this uh, house and workshop but uh, it did and I think uh, uh, what uh, struck me and the other that uh, awarded this project was the fact that uh, we were capable to work, as I said before, with a great respect for the origin and for the original pieces to be maintained, but by being bold enough to work a completely contemporary on the interior and making, uh, to use his words on the New York Times, a box within the box. Um, so it's located in one of the area of Venice that is still uh, inhabited by Venetians, believe it or not. Uh, and it's a fantastic area, the area of the Misericordia. I'm sure some rough can tell what to think about it. Uh, and this was the condition that the client had the, the house. This, as you can see, has uh, decoration and columns and windows. Now you have to know that this was the wall of the garden of this palazzo here, which uh, has a magnificent front, which is called Palazzo Lezze. And uh, like 90% of the time, the noble palazzo had also a beautiful garden on the back. Uh, the, the garden uh, usually end with, the, if it was facing the water, with this wall that was uh, like a quinta. Uh, a theatrical element to conclude the garden and to open up to the water, so to the gate of water where the noble, if their palazzo didn't face the water per se, entered. My client was so lucky to have uh, not just a wall, but to have a, a warehouse. What was a warehouse in the 19th century transformed very simply, but to house both, but among these, he was able to have the entire garden of the palazzo. So, the other one had the palazzo, but he has this little jewel that, by the way, was made by Baldassare Longhena, one of the prominent architects in Venice, in the Villa Settecento, and the warehouse. The warehouse in the interior was this. So it was sand, 
basically. This was the stepping down to the water. You see all the algae that were eroding everything. But there were a few stones, the original ones, that we were able then to keep. Fortunately, because the roof was collapsing, they fixed the roof like 10 years before uh, I got the commission, but and they fixed the windows, but the rest, as you can see, was left to this kind of condition, and you see the humidity cleaning up the, the walls. And so, the, oh, and this is the exterior towards, towards the garden, you can clearly see that it doesn't have the same noble elements like the facade on the water, but still, like it used to be done, they need the masks and the faces on top of the chiave di volta of the door. Now, this is what we operate, and you can see the space is very tiny to give you with 60 square meters plus the attic, which is four, so there's no matter all of 100 square, square meters. And the client uh, had many requests. <laughs> many requests because, uh, you know, among uh, the regular thing that you want in your house, he's a collector of books and he has uh, more than 10,000 books. So he wants to have all the books in 60 square meters. Okay, so a task within the task. And so this is how we organize it, by maintaining, of course, the original structure, but by detaching completely from the original structure. This means that when you are working on a ground level in Venice, you have uh, what uh, is called la vasca d'acqua. So it's the bath of water. Basically, you dig down the foundation and then you come up with a concrete um, with a concrete um, element that surrounds the entire perimeter to protect the water to enter. Now, the superintendenza, the heritage, um, didn't, of course, let us do anything like that. So we had to leave a gap between the wall and the, and the concrete. But this, this helped me to structure something that I think was, at the end, the real reason why the, um, the critic of the New York Times came to this. Because I said, usually in Venice, at the ground level, you fight the water, okay? You don't want the water to invade, of course, and destroy all your furniture and elements. I take the opportunity to play with the water and make this vasca d'acqua at a certain height to protect, even in high tides, the rest of the house, but letting the water in on the perimeter so that the water enters into the house. And this is the second level. You see there was a, this stair in the center that divided the area of the, uh, the meals or dining. And you know, here always have a lot of guests. They want a huge table, a little kitchen, a secret bath. You pass through the library in the, in the bathroom. And the system of the library that surrounds the perimeter and the exit down to the gate of water where you enter through here. Uh, those were the stones that I say, the original one, and those ones are the three new stones that I made to access the water. When you go up through these metal, uh, metal and glass uh, stairs, you arrive at this catwalk that become the perimeter and create this double, double height and surrounds all the library that continue to go up. This is the attic with his bedroom, his personal bathroom, wardrobe, a lot of wardrobe here, and this glass which closes the kitchen, plus this glass here, <coughs> you step up, and he has his own little private office that I think you can see better in this, in this section. So you come up, you have the library that goes all the way up for seven meters, which is the interior height. I preserved we preserve with my team all the decoration that since this was a wall, it had an interior and an exterior for the water, you know? So also the people in the garden were able to see the decoration. And now you see some shots taken from the exact same position before and after. And here you see the gate of water and the same gate, the same mask you see here, and you see his little office up on top of this glass, which is supported by those cables. And here you see what I was telling you, 
I mean, while it's up here on the glass cube, up there, the water on the high tides enter into the water. He dances also in the kitchen, where he makes his uh, breakfast in the morning. Uh, I make his glass table on a double layer, uh, so <coughs> he can see through his uh, table down and see the level change of the, of the, of the tide. This is the stair, and you see the library. Below the, the space is very, very tiny, but I was very happy to have all this, uh, uh, all this uh, desire and request to be done. Uh, those two lamps, I'll just tell you to keep an eye on them and I will come back later. And here you see the stairs that leads up to the glass cube. And you see the library that surrounds the entire house. We were still boxing thing with books and so now it's literally three lines of books per but all ten thousand books. It's a vision from his uh, office down, now without the water, but when the water enters gets through here, you know, so it's contained in the Lascada. And here a nice shot which is kind of done. You can see the house he likes, because he's very proud of his house, uh, to take a uh, visible night long. This door opens so people walking with the, with the boat can see inside. It's very nice, actually. And goes back to what I told about Kafowska. That the Venetians like to, to show off a little bit, I guess. And now you see different scales, different uh, elements, but a very, I would say, those approach for each one of them where the attention to detail, the attention to really for this house, you cannot work if not by millimeters, you know, to have everything put together and you can imagine also those guys with the glass arriving with the boat to put the glass inside. Uh, they broke many glass but they substitute every time. Because if you really in Italy I would say have those guys that when they're put in situation that are extreme, they take the task. And those guys, uh, I mean, change the top glass where the office is three times. They made the mistake. They would, the, last, the second one was terrible. They placed with the machine, with the, the element went down and down. So one, one down, two down, three down, the four cracked. I mean, they cried, but <laughs> <laughs> they didn't, so they substituted the thing. But I'm saying that because the craftsmanship and the way, I'll say with a capital A, the way of being artisan, um, I hope is reflected also in what you will see now. I think uh, uh, Steve Jobs uh, did a, uh, made a great quote, uh, and I really follow uh, this way of thinking in, in the industrial design, because a, a, an object needs to work need to work for the people and for the user of those objects. And it doesn't, I mean, it can be cool, whatever, but need to work, okay? And having said that, um, those are the words that are introduced to this section of the lecture, for craftsmanship, detail, and function. Four elements that when you work, I, I said with pleasure, it makes him Tracy class the other day, uh, talking about element of furniture and I taught them what I think about it, and I think I hope here they can see my approach. This is ribbon. Ribbon uh, <coughs> was born, literally, as you can see, with a very simple gesture. Um, something that can appear as a, a sign done well with a pencil on the paper, but to do this lamp took more than a year to control the thickness of the metal, to control the weight of the metal, to be able to make those curvilinear angles that let the two flex part not to bend, but to remain in position. But also I learned a lot by doing these things because I learned that materials have memory, so even if uh, your child or someone tried to bend those things, if it's not, uh, I mean, Hulk, uh, these things goes back in position because of this round edge. And uh, I mean, 
this lamp uh, actually is probably among with the last one that you will see. My, uh, you don't have a favorite sun, but I say it's uh, the one that uh, caused most in terms of research. And so that's why I'm very happy to this, to this lamp. Um, I tend and try uh, to work in families. So as you see, there is a little one, there is a table one, there is a suspended one, but I think also Industrial design, like Maurizio shows with the other uh, maestri, uh, let you play a little bit something that with architecture you do, but to a certain extent. You know, you do prototypes. If you don't like it, you throw it away. But if you do a building that you don't like, that's a problem. Okay? Okay. So you see a family of three little lamps. Uh, uh, and me testing the day, this is the chrome one, the elite one, but uh, I mean, it was very nice. And last year I worked with metal, I go back to the lamp that I spotted you at uh, Casini Palazzo Lezze, which is Mirage. Mirage actually took a lot of time in research, and uh, this that looks metal is glass, and it was very appropriate for uh, Casini Palazzo Lezze, where the glass and the reflection was the topic. To, for my research. Here, you, well, I had the fortune to live uh, near Murano Island. I mean, Mestre Venice Murano, one of the famous islands, where I think you all know they do the blown glass. And uh, I sat uh, many days with the, what are so called maestri, vitrai, so the masters of blowing glass, to understand the technique of what you can do and what you cannot do when you blow glass. And so, to make the story short, it takes three, three uh, the process took three times to have the finished lamp because you have to create the exterior part, which is this uh, uh, silver and shining glass element, and you have to have another thinner one, which is the white that you have in, inside, and then you have to blow them together. So you have back again to the oven, get it to a certain temperature, put them together, and then uh, those minus trees cut them off those elements from the first blown glass to have this laser effect system back. And again the family, the wall, and for the <coughs> and for the for the higher one. This is Ila, another glass lamp. Uh, which uh, uh, is meaningful in terms of how an industrial design piece can research surprise also to you that conceived it. Because uh, when I did the initial project of this, you see those uh, elements, those sort of bubble elements there, uh, were holes. Because I thought that uh, for the heating you need to have uh, many more of those. But uh, the technicians uh, of the company I did the project for told me that since I had these things more open towards the end, you see that as this shape, this is better than enough. But I like the idea of those things. And so they came with a machine that while the, while the glass uh, is still uh, uh, soft, they like uh, clamp the thing like that with this machine, so to create but not break all the way this. And the surprising effect was that when the light hits those things as a rounded, the light has a very extraordinary shining star-like effect. So it was a surprise that I didn't calculate, I admit. Um, it was very nice to discover. Here are some other shots of the same lamp in different possible configuration and solution. And this is the last one I was telling you, the one that I got the Good Design Award, which uh, I have to say I'm very proud. And uh, I mean, this actually, the jury, the motivation of the jury for the prize was the thing that really made me very happy because they understand the concept I thought the lamp would. But first of all, is an example of lamp in which the lamp is detached make the sense. I mean, you can use those pipes, those glass pipes, anywhere without this piece that is the regular configuration you can buy <coughs> the, 
the length width, but you can ask as a request to adjust the cylinders if you have another source of light that you want to illuminate those in a different way. But the other important thing is that, probably I don't know if you can see it here, those cylinders are all by a ring, a silicon ring, a silicon ring that you can move along the pipe and the, the, when you play it and change the direction of the pipe and the inclination of the cylinder and so you can literally make this lamp the way you like it. So as an example they say it in the note of a democrat design, which I really like it and I think uh, was uh, a very good interpretation of what I had in mind. You see here, you can have a vertical tank. Okay? You can do whatever you want. The same lamp, the same guy of Venice wanted, so we changed the other one. <laughs> and we put this one. Okay. But you can use uh, the hotel pool, you see, you expand it, it's modular, you can never stop. And to give you a sense, this was when uh, the Salone del Mobile in Milano was presented. 5,000 pieces. And another thing that is very dear to me, those things with a little bit of air and condition move a little bit. And they, ding, ding, they generate this sound and it's fantastic. So it's when you put in place all the senses in the industrial design that is very, it's very dear to me because you use the senses. And now, some, uh, I better go a little bit quicker, uh, some shots. Uh, this was a competition that uh, I entered and uh, um, it was very funny because the competition was, the title of the competition it was Submit the Chair, but this chair has to recall uh, a character from the movie. So I chose E.T. and my motto was Adopt an Ali. And <laughs> the jury appreciated that. And this is how it works. I mean, you see, like ET stays there and you can move it. And it's really funny that you open up, uh, you open up the place where you sit. You pull out the, the legs, as in my sketches are shown here. Keep sketching, guys. Keep sketching. And I mean, the rare part is movable. So it adjusts when you see it. So again, I wanted something not static, but something playful. And uh, so, so we did. Those are elements um, that uh, are in production now. And again, for the guys of Nancy and Tracy, benches. Uh, very simple, but very uh, linear, control, and uh, material made for the place, so we, those will go to um, an area around uh, water, so we use this kind of wood that uh, is like cooked wood, doesn't, doesn't vanish, and remains. The structure is a, it's a steel structure, very simple. Um, yes, people here can play, I know you, you have people that cannot play on your benches, but here they can. This is a bean, a basket, that actually has been made in carbon fiber. I don't have the, the image to show you, but in case I will send to Maurizio. And uh, it's, it's great because this egg that uh, will go around the city, actually will have the, part of them will be total white, but I think it will be a little bit dirty very soon. But the others can be colored uh, the way for the recycle. So you have the blue, the green, and the, the yellow for the river. And those yellow, those hangs around the city are making really a colorful, a colorful situation. Another, another bench, which is skin, because it has the, 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 steel, uh, um, the steel around it, and it gets the light. This, if you see, is a cousin on Mirage with those cuts, uh, so the lights at night gets out from below, from those laser cats. Uh, this is people that is also being made, another uh, concrete-like uh, uh, material to make those benches here, and have very free form. And sit-up, which is something that when you wake the bus, you know, and 
you are all tired, you young generation. You can <laughs> a little bit uh, there and play with your iPhone while you're waiting for the bus. <laughs> this is Vazina, that is Vase and Ina, Yantina, so a little plant. And actually this is uh, something I'm very interested in because here the structure is the plant. So the plant is supporting the bench and is an altogether very um, natural, if you want, with the wood and plant element. But architecture and industrial design can be done also when you think a set of plates. A uh, great chef in Italy, a friend of mine, uh, two Michelin star, very good, and uh, needed his own, his own set of plates because he has, you know, those fancy guys that are particular thing. How they really make an architecture in the plate. They want to, he wants to have something that really uh, help him in this sense. And so I came up with a solution with those uh, elements that can be placed one on top of the other, but also respond to his program uh, like, a, like a real architecture. For instance, you know, uh, you can flip those plates, this is for the main course, this is for the appetizer, this is for the first dish, and this is for the soup. Now, he has a fantastic soup that he likes, he comes to the table and pours to you, and so he will pour through this channel, so you see the soup coming, and the soup does a circle, and there is a ritual. And then left and right, he has a, a pink pepper and another spice that I don't remember, so you take those and you garnish your plate. It's a ritual, it's an architecture, and you can do it through that. Okay? So those are some renders of the plates. Last but not least on the industrial design is Plaquin. Plaquin is a project with, I started with other three friends last year. Uh, it started a little bit as a joke. This uh, girl, a friend, came to me and said, uh, is there any way to trace and keep track of when you have to sell a house? Uh, of the document that you go crazy when you have to go to the notary to sell it back and something that tells you the story of the building and, and on and on and on and I said yes and no so I researched and in fact something the way she was asking wasn't there so like a real database with all those folders to contain those information that were accessible she said well I have this idea why don't you create something that we can put inside the wall with a USB, with USB pen. I said, that's really too complicated. Let's use the uh, technology that we have today. And uh, I said, there is the QR code that is a free source, uh, is a free source uh, uh, Stargate to another universe to do that. But let's make the thing recognizable. And so she asked me to design something and I came up with this uh, that uh, we patent, we patent the, the plaque and the process because uh, yes, the QR code is free, but uh, this QR code introduced you to a database that is patent and so we set up this company and uh, basically in this uh, database you can put any kind of data that you want. I mean, you have a monument, uh, you have all the documents from for the monument, you have a School of Architecture, you want to put the lecture series poster there, someone goes with his iPhone and pop in. I mean, there are infinite possibilities, and uh, I feel a little bit like Steve Jobs, but it's not uh, one more thing, but uh, I have a real plaque in here that uh, I like to donate to the school. And uh, so hopefully you will put it outside, and whenever you tell me what you like to put inside, I will send to our our ID and uh, we will activate the plaque and so you all can uh, but you invent what you want you want video you can put video you can go to this lecture you put the lecture I mean, you may so you think about it but the plaque is for the school so I give it a <laughs> and I gave the plaque to all my clients see the Venice house this is another project. And with the plaque, actually, and this is very serious, we want, with Michele De Lucchi, the competition in Milan, uh, part of the design that we're doing for the expo part of the Navigli, 
data from VLAN. We'll have uh, 200 display that now with the look you are designing, and those display will contain plugin. In this case, plugin here is the process that I just told you. So it will tell you about the metro Milano, about the nature where you are, about what's happening there, if there are restaurants, which is the track, uh, kids, uh, where you can rent the bike, you can rent the bike through the park, and so you invent it and we make it for real. And parking will be around the expo, so it was a good, uh, a very good thing for our company. But as the playfulness for the proper industrial design, there is a playfulness also in the interior design. And for instance, this was a commission of, uh, that a friend of mine that uh, has uh, his son, that is the best friend of my son, uh, told me that he has an, an attic uh, on his villa and he wants to make uh, poor kid the living space uh, of uh, Nicolò, his son. And he told me this guy has so many toys and he never puts them in order. So can you come up with something? And I said, well, I don't want to ruin the space, but let's make something theatrical. And so I came out with this wall that fits inside the, uh, the, the roof that has, uh, is tilted. And so help me in finding a perspective and, and create those uh, Sorry, create those cuts, in very free cuts, free form, something that the child can draw on a canvas. And so with the kid, we did the thing and we came out with those elements and now it's not that tidy every time, but the kid put in order his, his, uh, his toys. He likes the form, he likes uh, to play with them, and as you can see, he has this beautiful space where they, they can play and they are, in a way, in a, in a part of architecture uh, that uh, surround them even if they don't know them. And this is talking about the interior design. I show you something that is uh, private in a way, because it's something that architects usually don't show. This is my house, so I will show a piece of my house. Uh, but this is uh, the house, which is um, uh, not very big, but uh, fulfill all our needs now. Unfortunately, this slide is a little bit cut here, but uh, fulfill the need, uh, uh, my need and my family need. And uh, we like to have uh, people, so I mean, the living room was the main space. So we found this ex industrial um, place that was a ruin, and so I was able to really reshape it the way I wanted. And it's on the second floor, so you enter from a little tiny courtyard. And, you know, for architects, stairs are always important. Here I cannot do much uh, because of the structure, but I polish up the, the stair and make it a volumetric at the beginning, and then become light uh, the moment you go up and you enter the house, which is here, uh, which has the this fireplace that, uh, it was Christmas when I did it. And this fireplace that uh, is the key moment uh, for the house. We open up all the roofs so of the back of the entire structure. And um, I went with the white, which is the color that in the interior I use 99% uh, of the time. And then it's because the color are you. The color are the people. The color are the things that you put in place from a vase to a book uh, to you name it. So having a white background and you, you make it alive. There is one thing that usually make a live dining room, this is the television. I don't like the television, not that I don't watch television, I don't like the television as an object, if not for some super piece of design that maybe we cannot afford, but I experiment. So I make the chimney my television. I find out to research um, a, ver a special vernis that transform the paint into a sort of film. And it is exactly like the film of the projector screen. So you don't need to take that projector uh, screen. Uh, you just hide the projector, and when you want, this is the effect. 
So watching a soccer game with the fire and a glass of wine is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Some extra details of the entrance, uh, the glass entrance that introduce to the other zones of the house. The kitchen, which is a cube within a cube, and then again a recurring topic. Uh, that is completely detached, as you can see from the structure. So it's a perfect view in the room, and that is part of my house. Uh, again, uh, here uh, another interior project of the renovation of a hotel um, hall in a very nice place called Asolo. And this was the condition, you know, besides that those are black and white, but was dark. <laughs> Okay, and it was heavy in, its, uh, in the way it presents itself, and this is how it is today. Uh, that maintain the warmth that the client wanted, but through the usage of uh, material that are very light, white, pristine, and there are glass elements combined to more traditional ones, but you know, just to tell you that uh, you can carry on your thoughts, idea, vision, but you can respond to clients. You know, my house, if you want, is a little bit more extreme, all white, the paving white. They wanted to have a surely more traditional warm effect, but you can work with all those conditions. Uh, as an architect, you're exposed to situations they well accepted that the new lobby desk, you see that it has again a system of skiing that goes in that. Uh, I like a lot to work with them, uh, what I call the magic windows, because uh, uh, this uh, glass cube pop out from the wall without uh, being accessible. There is a trick, of course, to access, but it's not visible. And it's, you know, those volumetric elements that are shaping the hotel with the part of the boutique uh, uh, and, and so on. And talking about interior, uh, I thought it was good to show you a task that I had here in America, in New York, for this company called Elufo. They make uh, dress for kids, and since the high-end uh, dresses, uh, since, uh, I mean, the prices in New York are outrageous, but also because it's their policy that they sell dress for kids, of course, the parents buy them, but they search for uh, small places. Here, I had the pleasure to work in Madison Avenue, uh, this was what I find. It's not my problem. Yeah. <laughs> this was what I find, and the situation, as you can see, again, heavy, uh, bad lighted, and you know, uh, the colors and you know the heaviness of the thing. So, in plan, you see, it's 28 square meters, so nothing. But we had to accommodate many things, like uh, the cashier, like. Uh, the videos to project on the magic mirror, so those are mirrors behind which there are displays that pops and so create a great effect for kids, they love it, but most of everything show the, we need to show the, the clothes. And so those are some renders, uh, study renders on how we thought the two level to be, how to make this super narrow, but still in the legal measure for the New York State, Catwalks uh, that has all glass part that we introduced to the upper part where they have a, a baby section. And here again, we use the white to illuminate such a tiny space and to create those paths that, through those uh, dynamic uh, uh, movement, really made the, the space bigger. And we did it through also effects like putting those mirrors that enlarge it. Many people bang their head on that, but you know they thought it was another part of the shop on the other side of the logo. But you know it worked. As you see, as you see, people think there's uh, something on the other side too. But okay, so the architectural tricks. And you see from this uh, render, from this section render, how tiny the thing is. But we were able to accommodate everything. And this is an idea the, the shop operates, you see from the wall, you have an element that pops out with videos here too, like we call them the magic mirror, but really the kids like them a lot, but you see 
uh, we change the flooring, we change everything, and we make again to the millimeter uh, each single piece that had to be shipped from Italy to New York because it was outrageous the price of New York to make those things do. And, but the local commission in New York sent us a letter at the end of the opening congratulating for the work because this was the facade. You see, dark and totally, I mean, ongoing. This was the, the whole thing during the works, and then at the end, uh, the, the final windows of Romain With the same company in Florence, in Via Tornaboni, uh, which is uh, uh, one of the if not the most important street for the shopping in Florence. And again, a bigger space, but not that big. And in where we place and refine even more the evolution of the, of the concept and the material. So we went to this uh, complete white to uh, oak uh, material, work, uh, varnish white, that uh, allow us to have those more warmy feeling, if you want, but still maintaining the cleanness and polish system. Here I was very happy because of the thing before I love stairs and there was the stairs to connect it, a new stair that I can put to connect it to that. It's not like the one in New York and this is this one you see very light on the back. The image is a little bit squeezed that you see but uh, the, the shop is not big anyway. Again the magic mirror popping up. So recurrent topics that are uh, requested by the client but you see how from the total white of New York we went to this um, in the paneling all the way to the top. And you see the double height system. So. Okay, so passing from the industrial design and the, and the interior design, let's go to the adaptive reuse. This house, uh, another project that uh, for me it's very important and very dear. It's actually the house of the owner of the uniform company. So uh, let's hope they continue to sell a lot of kids' clothes. And he lives in this area, in the countryside of Monfumo, which is uh, near Asolo and north of Treviso, which is uh, 50 kilometers north of Venice, to give you a sense of where we are. In a fantastic place that is protected by uh, the, the, those hills are protected the national heritage. Those are fantastic. So we have the hills of Siena and the hills of Azor, the two protected hills in Italy. And this was his house when he bought it. And this was uh, the condition that again made me cry when he showed me <laughs> the place. So, mm, so, and believe it or not, his house was also under the protection of the heritage, at least uh, this part here, which is the domestic part, that in fact uh, uh, maintained, fortunately, the original material and the solidity of the foundation. And so, you know, I had to keep entirely this piece and I had to keep the framing, the outline, ideally, of the adjacent piece where there was the granary, because this was a farmhouse. This was really the first sketch on site where uh, I got my first inspiration and these are, those are the plans. I start from the lower part because I want to show you how much we had to dig. Because from the main house, uh, this guy uh, that, as I told you, has a truly successful company, has a truly successful or not passion, which is collecting wines. So he said, I want the seller. That's the most important thing for me, the cell. So, okay, we call it the hell, where we were going, because it was hell to create the cellar, and today it's the hell, because when we go down there, we go to, to hell, you know? <laughs> and in any case, I want to show you that the original house, uh, I don't know if you, did you see the double line? The house is this one. And this portion is the portion underneath the house, and this portion is all new, created under the hill. And there you go. That's my client. Okay? So, proportionally, it was very tough to dig out. You see the, the house, and you see what we were doing, the crazy hell. And this is the house with its new distribution. 
Um, so you enter here where you have the main stair that will conduct through the entire house. A stair that actually, for me, was very important to be readable anywhere from the house so that the section of the house was always understand. So, you know, there are openings, there are connections which are tr made through the stair that goes up and goes down, down to, to the cellar. This is the domestic, more domestic part, as I like to call it, where there is the, the kitchen, the, the table, and the uh, secret bathroom through the wardrobe, and the little elevator that actually goes from down up to their main master bedroom. And this part here is where the garage is, underneath the hill, okay? So, this was the ongoing process. We had to infill, you see the, all those holes, to infill all the original stones with, um, with this material to um, linkage them together because uh, they were all <coughs> collapsing. So, then we had, uh, since this is an earthquake zone, to in insert those uh, uh, concrete pillars all the way up and here you see what remained during this phase and this part was what the granary was here the new foundation and here as I told you before when I operate with something new attached to all, something old I want to expose the structure so this was the structure that is still readable on the exterior of the of the finishing design that you will see later on. So here are the new, I mean, it was an empty shell, basically. We remade all the levels and everything. Here you see the stone that start to be polished after uh, the infill we made, and here they will start to peel it off. And here the section I was telling you, very important. This is the, the stair I was telling you that leads you up to this zone and to the other living, the upper more private living room. And from there, you can decide either to go to the zone <coughs> or to take this very light stair that goes to the master bedroom. Or you go down and you are connected to the, to the cellar. Now you see and you understand what we did. Okay? The more excavation, here is where the cellar, here is the house, and up here there is the master bedroom. Now, my client, like Batman, take the elevators, goes down. <coughs> Away with his Batmobile. And <laughs> true, he has a Batmobile. And this is uh, how you start to see the finishing process. And you start to see this there. The wheel of connecting interior and exterior for real, bringing the picture inside, exposing all the structure uh, we work with, but for the material continue to work with the material, having the same stone of the shell exposed, also inside, inside the house. The kitchen, on the module which is attached, everything that is attached has been cladded with the tech wood, to have a, a durable wood. This is the stair I was telling you before. This is a unique piece of metal, 8 mm thick, all the way to separate this black part where there is all grayish part of the circulation for everyone versus the light more pure that leads up to their bedroom. As I said, this one, or you can take the catwalk to the the catwalk, the glass catwalk that I really like this picture because it's like liquid, uh, liquid painting that goes to the living. The more private living you see, you know, the panorama makes it all, of course, so, and the surrounding nature is fantastic. Here, uh, a shot of the more private living room, their bedroom, uh, their bathtub. Now, even when you make a bathtub, you don't throw it there because they want the bathtub, but this is on the level, set on the level, you see there are some steps up, so that to let them when they're taking the bath, view out and I mean a frame view towards a fantastic church that is on the other side of the day. And I'll take you to help. <laughs> this is help. Uh, we just started to, he was bringing the wines, so there are not many today, uh, organized with all the 
like the glass cases, it's fantastic. So you continue to see the material. This part with the bricks goes not to the foundation. The foundation, I don't know if you remember the, the slides before, had a hole in between, so you have the real ground, so the humidity is natural, controlled, but natural, because those, uh, uh, those bricks are put on the sand, literally. So the foundation, I make a perimeter around, but this part was left for the cell. Another shot. Not about place. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> and here, you yeah. are. So you remember what we find, and here what we at the end got. All different angles. Again, adaptive reuse. Those are lofts. This was a warehouse back in Mestre. Uh, this is long, closer to the city center, which is here. This was the what the client had, and he said, I want eight loft apartments. Okay, <laughs> let's try. And so, we had to maintain the maximum height of these uh, elements, but we were allowed to push it forward, so to construct uh, uh, to the limit of those two lower ones. This was the back, and again, the condition, you see, this was uh, where they were fixing buses, okay? So he wants eight lofts. So I said to him, okay, let's see what we can do. And like a mirror place, I set up a central courtyard with the stair, a very light stair, done different from the other examples that you've seen, where the steel is treated in a pristine way, perfectly lacquered or colored. Here I want the material to be rough, because we were in an old warehouse, so that uh, there are some typical structure of the post-industrial elements. And so I want again to expose the structure, but use it in a rough way. Um, you have uh, four apartment down and four apartment up with the garage set here that leads you directly into the courtyard. So here you have all the living room exposed towards the courtyard and there you can reach them through those catwalks, the main one. And all those catwalks and, and elements are supported by cables that came down from the trusses up here, you see? And they support, you see, the cables in the catwalks and the stair, which is suspended, um, and again, give this sense of light, uh, lightness. This is the facade, how it turned out. And so you have a memory of the adjacent one. This is how we came. Again, I want to use the old material of the wood of the bricks that was present there, and the upper part we clad it in, in this material that is called parklets. It's a sort of wood that uh, doesn't doesn't get rough. The interior, where you see the rough steel, uh, properly rough. Uh, for all the connection and circulation, so to mark it clearly. And the stair, which is protected by this glass element that goes accordingly to the sloping of the stair and protects you. You are always protected because the connection are all protected by glass. You see a spot at night time, which I think uh, tells you that, uh, uh, tells you um, about the Sold all the departments. So it's very happy. <laughs> Here are some details of the cables I was telling you that support the entire system. Say, and we are protecting where we're working. Okay, so the last section of the lecture is about uh, program construction system, and sustainability, and different approach among the topics uh, that are most of everything residential. This is a co-housing example of a, a fantastic story because uh, this is the land we had and uh, you have to know that our clients were commissioned the project, did commission the project to another, to another colleague that came out for the four lots with those things. 
And the 32 families that bought the land, say, after seeing that, they said, no, that's what not we invest our money for. We don't want, we want to change architect. The budget was very low, so they came to us and asked for something different. We studied, again, we studied uh, some of the examples, Richard Meyer, Lorosisa, Terrani, for those housing possibilities. And this is the scheme we came out in a very narrow lot uh, for 32 apartments. But surely we wanted a beginning and an end. We wanted to work with scale. And as I said, the budget was very low, so we we worked an all white, uh, very simple material. But again, we went over and want to expose the structure a little bit a la so to have all the uh, all the um, terraces that are supported that hang to the flat uh, facade, so to have movement, you know, and work through volumes uh, and material. But again, in a very simple way, and they they are very very happy. You see the reflection of what they have in front, and now they say bye bye to the other, and with a certain happiness. And uh, this is uh, the lower part of the intervention, and this is the part facing south where they have all the louvers and system, and this is the head of the intervention for prominence on the street, so with a major urban presence. A very different approach, but a very complicated topic about this competition that we won in 2011, and I didn't start it yet, but we have some hope. And again, a land very particular with very different scale uh, in an urban condition that was interesting because the new tram of the city just arrived there. It was an old school, a gym um, that actually was requested to maintain or repropose. So we tear down the school and we made those three towers here. There's a study of the shadow so not to invade or minimum invasion with their casting shadow because they're very high to the rest of the, of the fabrication around. Plus, there's a, um, there's a garden that actually below it has the, the gym. Uh, as it is a very, very big one, actually. And it stays completely under, it's completely under the, you see, the, the element. And this help us to create a base, a very transparent, a light base, after the glass, you pass to, to this uh, uh, element of glass that support the whole the big supermarket and the parking lot underneath. And on top, you have those three towers that are clouded in teku, this material that is very green. This part of the city is called, uh, it's called uh, green, green Marghera, so the material was done also with this purpose. And you see underneath here, there is the gym with the skylight on top. And here you have some, some views. Okay. Yeah, I'll go very quickly to show you the last project before the conclusion. And uh, this is a lot where we introduced this uh, uh, town hall. Town hall that uh, was done according to the law. And you see this circular inclined place where was the meeting hall for the municipality was. But they went out of budget. So we proposed this element in the in the middle, in the core, that was intended to be a covered piazza. This covered piazza, coming from the uh, exterior piazza, was, uh, those are images uh, during construction, was in connection so that to have a permeable, a very permeable building. All the offices on top are connected through catwalks, and here you see the making and in gypsum, so they can take it, it away when they want. This is the implied that can be completed one day. But you see those very uh, geometrical forms because these remind two towers that were there in the past. And one is where the mayor uh, actually has his office. And here you see the elements of the, of the meeting hall with all the catwalks. Now, what is very nice that made this square a very democratic place because when the meeting takes place, people can see them from the catwalks so looking down. No tomatoes yet, so it's working. And the guys are having, I mean, a good time in experiencing a town hall that became also a piazza for the population. Okay, 
this is uh, the last thing, which is the movie theater, Candiani, that we are working in adjacent, in attachment to this building, with this cloud here that uh, is a semantic thing that might change the colors while uh, the things are going on, the plays are taken, so you also, as a citizen, know what is going on inside there. Uh, it's, it's a long story of this, but I make it short. I mean, it's more than 15 years they're working with this project. I was an helper, uh, I was still almost a student when they started talking about but now uh, we'll be open on December 12th. So the day after I'm leaving here, and go to the opening of the project in December, and you have uh, some feeling of uh, how it is. Okay, my conclusion goes to that. In Italian, if you ask, if they ask you, uh, what you do? Uh, most people will say faccio l'architetto, which uh, is okay, but I prefer to say, so in English this would be translated I do architecture, it doesn't sound very good, right? I prefer to say sono architetto, which in your language actually get translated very well, saying I'm an architect. And the way I say I'm an architect means that I, I'm an architect uh, really 365 days, 360 <laughs> thinking every day. And it doesn't matter if you are an architect with your father here in the way of Syracuse when I got the camp to visit me and now we were practicing together or with my students in Florence or with Richard Meyer. It doesn't matter. I'm an architect 24-7. Thank you very much. Yeah, why don't you ask me the question?